Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Holly Randall Unfiltered. I am very excited today to have my guest who has been in porn for over a decade, where she quickly developed a passion for advocating for women's rights and sexual freedom. She's now written a memoir about her evolution in the industry called From Princess to Porn Star, A Real Life Cinderella Story. Welcome the one and only Tasha Rain. Hello. Hello. Thanks for having me. You are so welcome. Thank you for coming. I'm so happy to see you. I know. It's been a minute. I know. It's been a minute. I mean, you, I mean, like I said in my intro, you've been in the industry for over a decade. Um, it's okay if that, you know, you're mentioning earlier, you're like, wow, that makes me feel old. I've been in the industry for 25 years. So it's like, amazing. I'm, if anyone's old here, it's me. Yeah, you win that. I, do, I, I win the old contest. <laughs> Woo! Finally, I win something. I never win shit. <laughs> um, but I mean, it's just, it's, it's nice to talk to veterans because, you know, you were around kind of when like magazines were a thing and like the industry was just so much more different than it is now. Yeah. Which is always like, it's kind of fun to talk to people who've seen that evolution and seen that change. Yeah. So let's start at the beginning for you. Um, you had a stint on season three of Laguna Beach. <laughs> yeah. To start, right? So how did you get cast on that show and what was that experience like? So I grew up in Laguna Beach, California, where the show took place. And when they came to our school, I was actually at a boarding school that year only so I wasn't home like I wasn't even there for the first season and the second season casting and I was also a sophomore in high school when they started the show and then I came back from boarding school and they were doing a casting for the third season and I think it's just like a word of mouth type of thing where they ask like the former cast members like who should we interview they actually allow you to go and like submit your name into a box if you're interested and then they hold these literal casting couch interviews where there's like a casting couch and casting directors and an office space and you're with your friends and they're like what what's your name what's your how do you identify at school like are you cool are you not cool whatever and mm -hmm. so it's like you talk in front of them and then they are able to look and be like okay I want this group of kids to be you know our cast members and so my group of friends and I got a call back and we were like so <laughs> excited. It was it was so fun. Yeah. Yeah. I have to say I never watched the show. Well, so. that's not surprising. <laughs> Nobody watched our season, but the show in general you never saw, like the first or the second season. Maybe you just weren't the target audience. No. Although it really was the most popular show. It was crazy. Like No, I know it was. Like worldwide though. Yeah. Which I can't believe that. This is a very embarrassing question, but it was a reality show. Yeah. It was, or was it a, a reality drama. So it was the first of its kind. Okay. It was half reality, half scripted. It well, was I mean, like, bizarre. All reality is scripted, right? So this was the first kind of reality show that was meant to not look like a reality show. So like you don't. This is a difference. You don't talk to the camera. Okay, There's no like, gotcha. hi, I'm Rachel from Laguna Beach and I'm yeah. in this room and this is what's, ha that's a reality show. Right, right, right. Okay. But it's not a scripted show where we have like lines we memorize and if we don't have lines right, they make us say the exact line, right? It's more of improv. So it's like oh. meet at this location in Laguna for coffee on Saturday because you guys are already going to meet up for brunch, right? Right. Oh, okay. And then start talking. Oh, can we talk about Kellen? Can we talk about, can you say that one more time? That gotcha. line you said. So it's, it is scripted, but not. It's improv right. almost right. of your own life, though. That's what you're improving. You're improving like the actual thing that's happening to you in your teens. It's very weird. So, I mean, I get it. I mean, for shooting purposes, it's like you have to push those moments that are yeah you have make to. sense for camera otherwise totally filming but we were just hours and hours just of footage. children but yeah that would be a normal thing to do if it was like adults yeah. yes <laughs> so and then would they come in and like try to push some drama like okay oh, so yeah. and so like did something like aren't you mad can you talk yes. about that yeah of course they would want it to be just like the more dramatic, the better, because that's what a viewer wants to watch. Yeah, of course. Teens having drama. Yes. Oh. Who doesn't love that? Who doesn't love I love that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Scripted teen drama, like Gossip Girl. Love. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and then what did you do next after graduating high school? I moved up here to L.A. and I enrolled at Santa Monica College 
And I had two roommates from high school. And I was like, I really, I had wanted to be a Playboy model since I saw the girls next door Mm -hmm. when I was in high school. So when I moved up here, very naive, not really like understanding that you cannot just go on Craigslist and like find (laughs) That sounds so silly when I say it out loud. I probably knew deep down. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, you know, we probably were young. We do. You do crazy things. This is 10 years ago. Over 10 years ago, I was, you know, it was 2007 I graduated. So Mm -hmm. it was a long time ago. Um, But yeah, no, Craigslist didn't seem as, as seedy and weird as it is today. But I went to Santa Monica College and I, well, I'm trying to figure out the ex- the timeline's a little bit off, but I went on Craigslist and I found like an ad that was like Playboy, like audition for a Playboy model, and it kind of it looked a little wonky, but like I went and met this person, and, and she explained the job, and I was like, this has nothing to do with the ad. This is an yeah. escorting job, like it has right. nothing to do with what was advertised, but like. But that word Playboy probably <laughs> drew so many people Drew so in. many people. But then by the time you're, like, in this meeting, you're like, gosh, that sounds easy. <laughs> that's, mm-hmm. like, really fun. I'm in college. I already, like, go out and party and hook up with guys all the time for yeah, free. For free. For free. And not get paid for it. And not get paid for it. And right. they're, like, weird, young, loser guys. <laughs> Why not make some money? <laughs> right, right. Yeah. So, yeah. So I answered this ad on Craigslist. I started working as an escort that was like my first job in like the sex industry Mm -hmm. but I did not care for it very much so Mm -hmm. I was like okay well I still like want to be in the sex industry but maybe there's like something else I can do and so I started stripping can I ask you what what you didn't like about escorting well, I just didn't like the guys. Mm. So <laughs> that was the pro- the main Fair job. <laughs> and the thing is, is that as opposed to porn, where you only maybe have to spend like three hours with them, I would imagine. Actually, I guess no, I, no, I guess no. It no. Depends, this was quicker. Right? No, no, no. It wasn't. Yeah, it depends on what you're doing. This it wasn't. I'm thinking the of like timing. Long, long it was just some days, like. But, yeah. I think what really got me was just like. What, whoever the last client is that I saw when feels like literally a hundred years ago, this guy I was like oh my God, I would never do that again. And I just stopped. I was like, oh, that's not something I want to do. It's like, it just, it was, I was grossed out. And so I took a break and I was like, I don't want to like even do really anything to do with sex work. And mm-hmm. then I was like, no, I do like it. I do like sex work. I just don't want to like, I just don't want to escort. Mm-hmm. So then I went and found a, a job stripping at Silver Rain in like Westwood in mm-hmm. Los Angeles, mm-hmm. which was like still using my body to make money. But it just felt like safer and easier and just a little bit less crazy. Yeah. Did you ever feel unsafe escorting? Actually, I I felt like that I like the last person, whoever that was, I was just like the, it was just gross. No, I don't think it was an unsafe feeling actually. Yes, I have, but not during the timeline, not during this first part of escorting. Okay, no, gotcha. I did not. Okay. No. But just um Stripping just felt like more controlled. Mm-hmm. There's like people around and like mm-hmm. management, and it's just like you know, it's more organized and legal. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but it was it's a hustle, and it's a lot of talking, like a lot of like listening to people, and you're just like, oh my god, this oh is my god, who wants to do that? Who wants to listen to people? <laughs> no, I mean people <laughs> come to you with all their problems, their home life problems. Yeah, like, guys, and it's just wasn't, it's like only fans, yeah. but in person. Sure. Yeah. Okay. I mean, right? Like, you know, you do a lot of talking on OnlyFans. Yeah. I mean. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Mm. Same concept. Yeah. (laughs) A lot of labor. So, and I also wasn't making very much money doing that either. Mm. Because I feel like, and I could be wrong, but I just really feel like I I don't even know how to make money in a strip club. Like, I was not making good money. I was like, this is not Mm -hmm. where I want to be. And Mm -hmm. someone, some guy came in and was like, well, do you want to go up to the Playboy Mansion? I'm like, yeah, I do. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I've wanted to do this whole time. It's okay, I'll take you tomorrow. So I just like won the lottery. <laughs> Yay. Yeah. And how was that? Was it what you expected? At the time, yeah, I was like, this is the coolest thing ever. Oh my gosh. I've I had always wanted to like meet Hugh Hefner and like be part of his special kind of like club up at his house. Like mm-hmm. I had really like I had fantasized about this. So it was like a really big deal to me and I it was what I expected. 
exactly, actually. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I felt like I had already seen it because mm-hmm. of the show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. So can I ask you a question that's kind of an aside? Sure you can. You know, like, the new, like, the A&E documentary that came out and all these, like, oh my God. against half that have <laughs> yeah. come out? Like, oh, my God, yeah. How did that make you feel hearing about that, like, after having wanting to be a part of that? <laughs> so like, bad. <laughs> Oh my God, horrible. I called my mom when she was alive. I was like, Mom, have you seen this? She's like, oh, yeah. But she's like, she was so much older, you know, different generation. She's like, oh, I'm sure it's not true. I'm like, no, Mom, it is true. That's why we're talking about it. When there's smoke, there's fire. There's like, of course it's true. Of course. No, it's fucking horrible. Oh my God, my heart. All of my girlfriends from the mansion are all like texting each other and calling each other and messaging each other and like, even yesterday, one of them sent me in this video of a model that used to be up there when we were up there. And it was like this horrible interview, kind of like the a interview. Mm-hmm. And we're just like, holy fuck, how is this real? Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's a bad feeling. Yeah. <laughs> it's not good. <laughs> no. Yeah. I mean, I will say, like, they did interview my mom for that documentary. And she never had experiences like that with him. When yeah, me there. either. Sure. So. That's the whole point. That's why you yeah. feel bad. Yeah. Because, like, you... Yeah, everybody has their own experience, right? Right. And when you have the good experience, it's like, it's so disheartening to hear the people who had the bad experiences because, like, you just didn't know. Or you knew and you were just, like, turning a blind eyes how mm-hmm. I felt about my, how I feel about my experience for a lot of things where you're like, well, it didn't happen to me. Right, right. Right. Yeah. Like the selfishness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Which Absolutely. is, like, just human nature. It's fine. Absolutely. Yeah. So, okay, so you went to the Playboy Mansion. Um, So how did that lead you to adult work? So I was spending a lot of time up there, like, committing my Fridays, my Saturdays, my Sundays, really, like, (laughs) die hard. Like, I was just, that was just my life. I was obsessed. And so I, like, worked up the courage to ask Kef if I could test for Playmate. And he's like, yeah, you can. And I was so excited. And so... I went down to the Santa Monica Playboy studio and tested with Arnie. And I was like, oh, my gosh, I can't wait. And I went to his house, like Hef's house after that shoot that night for like moving movie night and talked to him about the shoot. And I was just really hopeful. And then a couple, maybe like a week later or whatever, I got a phone call and it was like, a lady that just said that, you know, it's, you know, so-and-so from Playboy and you did not, you did not make Playmate, but don't worry, we'll use your photos for like Cyber Girl. I was like, what the fuck? I was so mad. I was so sad because I had put, invested so much time in just like my relationship with him. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like a sexual relationship or anything. It was just literally, I was there all the time and I really like felt like I was his friend Mm -hmm. and friends with everybody up there. And I just honestly thought it was a shoe in like in my mind, <laughs> you know, it felt like that. Yeah. And I also was like, is it cause I'm not sleeping with him? Like what's going on? Like I just did, had no idea right. because I genuinely thought because I had been a playboy model before that, I just thought it was like a no brainer and the rejection. I was like, Oh my gosh, what am I going to do? This was like my dream. This is yeah. what I wanted, which by the way, are so many other women's dreams too. Yeah. And so that actually, just led me to a thought I had already had, which was like, well, I read How to Make Love Like a Porn Star, and that job looks similar, not the same, but similar to being a playmate in that you're like modeling and working in the adult industry and you can kind of control your situation a little bit more. Like Mm -hmm. you can work for more people Mm -hmm. and it just looks like you can take initiative in a way that I couldn't really when I was up there. So then when I was rejected, I was like, okay, well, I'm just going to try to see if I can get into the porn industry. And who did you, did you get an agent? Um, yes. I'm trying to think. I interviewed with like a few different agents and then I signed with some agent that like specializes in girl, girl and solo stuff. And he just didn't get me any work. Like I literally didn't have a job. And I was it like, wasn't Cam Smith, was it? No. I, although I, God, that sounds so familiar too. Cause he was like it an agent. Him, he actually ended up selling, selling, I don't know, 
whatever, whoever the girls he represented and Molly models ended up taking over like his. No. His roster yeah. No, girls. it but wasn't He was him. like the only big agent that I knew that pretty much only managed girl, girl performers. Or maybe solo. It wasn't him though. Okay. Whoever it was. And it's not that he wasn't like a legit agent. He actually had girls on his roster and he got people work. He just didn't get me any jobs. So I was like, I just want to out of this contract. If I'm not working in the porn industry, I'm young and like I haven't shot before. Like why would I not get That's something? kind of nuts to me because I remember when we got your photos and I remember, I think it was, who was your next agent that you were with? After I got out of this, this random contract was – LA Direct. I was going to say, yeah. because I remember LA Direct <laughs> yeah. sending you over. Yeah, yeah. They and were, you were beautiful. Yeah, you had yeah. an insane body, <laughs> natural big boobs. Yeah. And like you'd been well, a not Playboy. Natural, but they looked real. They looked real. Oh, right. They looked so real. Right. You're Nobody one of, even knew. You're one of the girls who had a boob job that looks fucking so real. I literally tell everybody, I'm like, I have the best boob job in the uh, yeah. porn industry. So and I boobs, feel confident saying that. I just remember not in my head thinking, like, <laughs> yeah. Because I obviously on the sheets, not like, Fake boobs, it doesn't say. <laughs> really? But I would, I'm surprised, actually, because I feel like fake boobs, you want to know if you're, like, shooting a video work, especially because it's you can see. The agents, they're not you and I anything. both know that they are not always transparent about everything. Yeah. Um, but I just <laughs> remember getting your pictures, and you were, like, so gorgeous, had an incredible body, and you were a Playboy model. And so I'm just, like, surprised. No, that- I know. I'm sure he was just busy, or maybe the photos that he took, maybe they weren't that um, great. It yeah. could be. Who even cares? The weird part was that he wouldn't let me out of that contract. He was like, no, you're mine. I'm like, dude, I need to, like, make money if this is going to be my job. Yeah. So I had to get out of who yeah. I, yeah, but, yeah, no. Then I went to LA Direct. Right. Yeah. So, okay, so you go to LA Direct. You start getting some work. Do you yeah. remember your first scene? Yeah. It was for Twisties, and I just shot with a photographer the other day for book promo, Dean Capture. Oh, we love he's Dean. He's so fabulous. Yes, that's a great first experience. I mean, he's so nice. Yeah. He's so thoughtful. I he's kept, so not creepy. He's so not creepy. I kept being like, God, this position is so ugly. Why would we want to shoot this position? I can't imagine somebody wants to see this position. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he's like, no, no, trust me. <laughs> this yeah. is good. <laughs> I'm like, no, it's ugly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's so he's so nice. I'm so happy to like know him. Yeah. Yeah. So was it a solo? It was a solo. So yeah. That's a nice intro too. Yeah, for twisties. It was lovely. And then what was pictures. your first like sex scene? Um, my first sex scene was for Greg Lansky for Reality Kings for like a girl, 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 which did not go that smoothly because they were just like so good. And I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing. This is so awkward. Yeah. <laughs> like no training. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's hard. Um, girl, girl, especially can be a little bit more difficult when you're new yeah. than boy, girl. Yeah. Because generally guys will kind of like, especially if they're very experienced, They'll kind of open you up to camera. They'll throw you around. Like, they'll help you kind of do everything. And with a girl girl, it can be trickier because sometimes it's harder to see what's going on because you don't have, like, a long penis. Which is, like, an analogy for life. (laughs) Girls are literally so much, like, more complex, complicated, smarter, (laughs) just better. Yeah. (laughs) So it was was an okay experience. Yeah, like it wasn't anything crazy. It was just like, gosh, I could have, this is really hard. I could have done better, or like mm-hmm. trained or prep, but you really can't. Yeah. You can't. It's a weird job where I just don't even know if there's a way to prep to be an adult. Because I feel like with mainstream acting, you can 100% prepare for that. Yeah. You can go to classes. Yes. But like, this is a craft too. It's just not one that you can prepare for yeah, yeah. as much. Like you can right. watch videos. And then, like, you mimic can. the videos. But, but that I mean, was it, not authentic. Right. I mean, I guess – it would be funny if someone started, like, a training course. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? But that would also be kind of shady. Be like, come have sex with me. Pay me to come have sex with me, and I will, like, show you how to make porn, which I, I also feel like – I think you need to, like, have no. the full sex. <laughs> no, 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 no. Yeah. But, like, I do – I definitely know agents who've used that line, like – you know, oh, I'm sure. let me, let me, sh- for free, let me oh, show you how yeah, this works. I'm you sure. Know, we'll do a test. Oh, God. <laughs> Terrifying. <laughs> it's a little different. Yeah. <laughs> so um, was porn something that clicked for you immediately or did you need like quite a few scenes under your belt before you felt that you hit your stride? 
Yeah, I definitely feel like for me, it took many scenes to realize like, okay, this is something I'm good at and that I enjoy doing and I can do it, but it's like a learning curve. Mm -hmm. I think that's probably common for most people. Yeah. Yeah. Was there one particular scene that you remember that went a certain way where it made you feel like, okay, I got this. Like now I understand or it clicked or like this was the first scene that I put out that I really feel like, you know, this is Tasha Rain. That's a good question. I think that when I started to shoot for my website that I just felt more confident because Mm -hmm. I was like, okay, well, I own this content and I chose this performer and I controlled this environment and this just, yeah, I like doing this. So I think when I got to shoot for myself, I I felt that way. And how far into porn were you when you started shooting your own content? Because most girls especially back then, like today, you know, everyone's got an OnlyFans and like right away starts an OnlyFans and then produces their own content. But, you know, before that came along, like getting your own website, like shooting your own content, it was a lot of work and a lot of girls didn't do that. Yeah, I started shooting like pretty soon after I joined the industry. I want to say it was like six months after I had signed with LA Direct and they actually made it really easy for me to do that. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't have known how to do that otherwise because I was able to like shoot with their other models and they already knew all the contacts and, you know, told me to go buy my my URL, my domain name. And so like it was easy for me to do that. But that is a big feat. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then – What happened when people from your hometown found out that you did porn? Well, that's – I felt, like, so insecure. Before I even, like, knew what they thought, I think I felt so insecure about my choice to do porn. Like, what would they think? Like, that anxiety overtook me. And then I think I, like, projected it upon other people. Mm -hmm. Um, It definitely was not, like – accepted among my friends or family or people and it didn't feel like it did not feel good it felt like oh gosh I've done something that is like socially unacceptable but that I think is cool but other people don't and (laughs) and everybody's like oh they'll come around they'll come around and it's true finally everybody came around for the most part so Mm. it was just like it just took years Mm. and years until I feel like people like processed it and then got over like the controversy of it and then time went by and now there's almost no uncomfortable feelings Mm -hmm. which is like incredible do you think that also maybe it took time for people to see that you could have longevity you could be successful you could be in a secure place. You could be like in a safe place before they could process that porn was okay. Cause I've just, I've talked mm-hmm. to a lot of girls who are like, when they first told their parents, you know, the first thing that their mom said was like, are you being sex trafficked? Or like, you know, mm-hmm. they think that you're going to get like HIV right away. Like, you know, mm-hmm. all these like crazy misconceptions that people have about the adult industry. And then after they saw like time went by and they were doing well and they weren't like, you know, dying of like some crazy disease and they weren't like being held at gunpoint, Mm. you know, at some guy's house that they were like, oh, okay, maybe this (laughs) is a legitimate job. I think that might have had something to do with it, but I think that the entire perception of adult from when I joined back in the day to today, overall, universally, but also in Southern California especially, has become so normalized. Mm. I don't even think I can say it has to do with me. I think it's like a a bigger issue of now, not an issue, it's a good thing. Like now the normalization of OnlyFans has created an environment where it is very acceptable Mm. amongst younger people especially and even older people that I'm friends with. It's Mm. almost as if... They've seen it all. Everybody has an OnlyFans. Everyone has sex tapes. Kim Kardashian is like the queen of America and she has sex online. So I genuinely feel like, yes, there are nuanced things like people's concern for your well-being. Absolutely. But I think it's it's more of like an acceptance in society. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that overall there's been a shift in the way that people see it. I mean, I still think that we're very far from being in a place where like sex work is accepted 
like well, the word overall. sex work also includes other things. I'm just talking kind of about porn. Right, right. Um, but uh, yeah, you're right. I mean, it, it's definitely what's been like the biggest change that you have seen in your past ten years in the industry, like in the industry specifically. I think the biggest change is the availability to own all of your own content and go online and be your produce your own producer, your own director and take control of the situation. Like you don't have to depend on an agent or anybody else to make an income and to shoot cool content. That's like the biggest thing that I've seen. And you think this is a positive change? For me, personally, I'm sure not for everybody in the industry. <laughs> <laughs> I could understand why it would not be positive for all sorts of people, but I think as a performer, as like a female performer, I think it is pretty incredible that it's that you can just do that from your home. Mm -hmm. It's wild yeah. to think about. It is crazy. You can just shoot stuff on your cell phone in your bedroom and like make money off of that. It's amazing. It is amazing. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I personally, and I've said this a lot of times, you know, as a producer and also someone who has an OnlyFans, yeah. that, that supplements my income in a way that's allowed me to be selective about the shooting jobs that I take, which is so, I'm so grateful for. And especially having become a mom, which we'll get into later, like has given me so much more free time to spend with my family. Oh, I um, love that. I think it's a positive thing, and I think it's a positive yeah. thing for brands and producers too. Yes, some smaller brands have kind of died off, but I mean, you cannot say that a lot of these big brands are not shooting anymore. I mean, the budgets are bigger than they've like ever been. Like people are putting out these huge, crazy movies yes. with like a lot of production value. You know, yeah. people are working a ton, and yeah. yeah, there are some performers who you know, don't want to go back to AKA mainstream porn, yeah. AKA shoot for studios. But yeah. you know what? Like as a producer, personally, I feel like I only want to shoot people who really want to be there. 100%. Anyways, like I want, you know, and if you, the girls who, who came to set because like they had to do it to make money, but didn't really want to do the shoot. Like if you can make that money at home on OnlyFans for whatever yeah. reason, and you don't want to uh, come back to the studio. Like yeah. I get that. And I feel like it's better for everybody. I like do too. let everybody be happy yeah. <laughs> with what they're doing. 100%. You know what I mean? <laughs> I agree. Yeah. All right, guys, we will be right back. And when we come back, Tasha is going to tell us about what it was like to become a mom, about speaking at universities regarding consent, and of course, about her new book, Princess to Porn Star. Stick around, I'll see you in a minute. This episode of Holly Randall Unfiltered is brought to you by Adam and Eve. Who wants better sex? And who wants to start having better sex immediately? The best way to get started is to go to adamandeve.com right now, the online superstore for everything sexy. They are offering 50% off of any one item. Plus when you select your one item, you will also get three special bonus gifts that includes an item for him, a special toy for her, and something we know you'll both enjoy. Also get six free movies and free discreet shipping. But you can only get the special offer when you go to adamandeve.com and use code HOLLY. So be sure to use code HOLLY to get your 50% discount, 10 free gifts, and free shipping today. Hey, everybody. We are back. Okay, so Tasha, um, you pursued a higher education after you were already fully immersed in the porn industry. I know this is something that you and I kind of share. Um, so why was it so important for you to n get not just one but two degrees? Oh, well, I feel like I talk about it in my book a lot, but basically – so I always felt like I needed to go to – college because my family expected that of me, but I definitely felt like when I got into porn that I needed to have multiple degrees, if not more than two, because people have a perception that they put on you and it's that, you know, if you're doing porn, you must not be smart. And like, mm -hmm. I, I just think it was a defense mechanism. I'm like, I've got to go get some degrees. I cannot have people thinking this of me. <laughs> That's is, the fucking truth. I mean, and I appreciate your honesty. I mean, I, I I can relate because I also went to UCLA and like finished up my degree there while I knew I was going to be in porn. And it was the same kind of thing. Like my family expected it of me. I knew my dad would like never let it go if I didn't fucking graduate college. Never. And then, <laughs> yeah, number yeah. two, I just, I don't know. I'd always expected to go to college and I'd always yeah. expected to get like, I mean, I only have one degree. Um, but that just felt like yeah. I just needed to finish that totally. path yeah. 
for myself. Yeah. So what was it like Mm -hmm. working in porn and going to school at the same time? Oh my gosh. I feel like, well, working in porn and going to school at the same time is chaotic because as you know, porn is really demanding and you have to show up at times when you are busy doing maybe other things like your schoolwork and vice versa. And so those are two huge commitments. And so it just took me a while to finish my education because I prioritized being able to like go to set last minute, you know, Mm -hmm. the day before like, oh, hey, you're shooting tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So I only took like a few classes at a time towards the end there at UCLA. Um, But it was definitely it was interesting. I, did, I don't feel like I was talking about porn a lot while I was like at school. Like it wasn't like, you know, my conversation, but that is what I was doing. Did people ever school. recognize you at school? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Throughout my undergrad and my master's program, people recognized me or would like want to take photos and stuff with me on campus. And I would be able to like talk to classes. Sometimes teachers would hire me to talk to their class about the porn industry. I think it's fascinating how, in California at least, academics are infatuated with the porn industry. Mm -hmm. (laughs) They want the porn girls to come (laughs) to school (laughs) and talk. (laughs) And that's always been, like, fascinating to me. It's actually something I've always wanted to do as well. Oh, you would be so good at that. But I've never... You would literally know, like, be so good at that. All right. Hear that university? Yes. Yeah, oh, my gosh. Come talk to your kids about yeah. porn. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to talk about DPs and double anal. I feel like I'm you gonna, would just be I like them. the best at that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean. Um, so you have uh, spoken at some um, fraternities on college campuses about consent specifically. Uh, how did a room full of college guys react to having a porn star talk to them about consensual sex? Did you feel like there was this weird misconception going into it and then things shifted at the end or did they seem pretty receptive to it? So talking to younger men about consent is definitely like rolling the dice. Like sometimes fraternities are just like really chill and the guys are really receptive, especially like a smaller group of guys, Mm -hmm. but it's like a big room and it's a ton of fraternity brothers. They like almost become like a wolf pack or like hyenas and they get like really like excited and crazy. And it's honestly intense. You're like, oh my gosh, this is a lot of people packed in here. (laughs) And they are like, I don't know. They they feed off each other's energy. Yeah. And sometimes if, you know, one speaks out and says something stupid, then the other ones will. But overall, most of the times I got to go to these fraternities, they were really respectful and inquisitive and wanted to talk and have conversations and ask questions. And it was just like fascinating to me because – I'm, I mean, they just seem like such nice guys. It's it's crazy. They have such a bad reputation. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think, you know, a lot of them may not be educated about consent, right? Because, I mean, consent is something that we've only just started talking about very openly in the adult industry in general, you know, with like the boundary checklists that we have and stuff like that now. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was never something that was really like – a lot of things were assumed <laughs> – Correct. You know what I mean? Yes. So um, I can see how that would definitely be like a new topic of conversation, especially among like fraternity brothers. But do you feel like you got through to them? Like were there guys who came up to you afterwards and said anything that made you feel like, OK, I'm making a difference? Here? Oh, absolutely. I feel like the conversations had an effect on the fraternity brothers. But the main thing I really got from doing those talks was that the conversation about consent needs to happen way before kids get to college. Mm -hmm. That is something that like you and I need to teach our children Mm -hmm. when they're born. Like it needs to be like immediate, you know, because Mm -hmm. it's something that I have, you know, nephews and you can, they're young and you can just see like that conversation has to happen so far before they get to college and are talking to an adult actress in a fraternity. It needs to happen just like in their household with their family and it needs to be transparent. And hopefully that is like the way that the new, the new generation is going. Yeah. So that leads me to ask you about becoming a mother because this conversation about consent, we'll get that into to a little bit. Um, has actually come up for me, like in terms of raising my daughter, you know, with all these new tools and information that we have at our disposal as being like new moms in this generation. 
So, so yeah, tell me a little bit about how has becoming a mother changed your life? So, oh my gosh, first of all, it's the best thing that ever happened to me. Like, I can't imagine my life without being a mom. It's really, I really feel like that. And I feel a little bit awkward when I'm like talking to my friends that don't have kids because I sound like I'm preaching to them. Like, you need to go have kids. But I, I that's how I feel. I'm like, oh my gosh, yeah. you're not even living. Like, you need to go have a baby. This is the best <laughs> thing that's ever happened. <laughs> They're like, okay, crazy. Like, yeah. you know, because not everybody wants to be a parent. But yeah, it's it was my dream since I was a little girl to be a mom. And when I hit 30, I was like, fuck. Oh my God. I want to be a mom. I've wanted to be a mom, but it's like, I've been working. I haven't been prioritizing finding a partner. And I just, I honestly had like a midlife crisis, like a panic, you know, like, oh my gosh, what am I doing? Um, and so I tried really hard to become a mom really quickly. And um, now that I'm a mom, I'm like, I want five kids. Like, mm -hmm. I just am obsessed with it. It's so much fun. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, I hear you about like the friends who don't have moms. I definitely, I see like the misconceptions that I had um, before I had a kid. Like I understand what parents go through now in a way that I didn't get before, you know what I mean? And I just see things so differently. Um, and I absolutely understand, like, I have a lot of friends who don't want to be parents and like, I totally get that. And like, you know, you should only do what works for you. And I don't think that, I think a lot of people are not suited to have children. So like, if you don't want kids for God's sakes, don't, don't do it. You know, it's a fucking massive commitment and it's so much work, but yeah, like you, I do feel like it was something that I always wanted. And now that I have a daughter, like, she's just so rad. It's yeah. just like, there's just, it's, cra it's also crazy to, to watch them grow up and watch them figure the world out. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like you see, like there are sometimes, you know, she's at the age now where I'm really, she can understand when I explain things to her. Like, um, so for example, my mom, um, reads her a story every night. And so my mom read her a story last night and then afterwards, like she didn't, she didn't want to like thank my mom or like tell her good night. She was just being like kind of bratty. She was like, man, I want to go sit on, you know, play with daddy. And I was just like, no, it's really important, you know, for you to, to thank people when they do something nice for you. And I kind of like sat her down and looked her in the eyes and like, Violet, listen to me. I'm like, when someone does something nice for you, it's really important to thank them and to tell them good night because it makes Suzma, that's what we call her. We, it makes Suzma feel really good. And it's really important to make people feel good about themselves. And she was like, okay. And then she like went and like thanked her. She's like, thank you, Ma Suzma. Thank you, good night. And like gave her a big hug and a kiss. And I was like, but you know, it's like those moments where they like yeah. start to, to yeah. get it. And you're like seeing the world through their lens. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's got that. Yeah. It's so exciting. It's also um, such a test of patience. Like have, how yeah. have you been – dealing with that. Do you feel like you're a patient person overall? Oh, I have my moments where I'm not patient <laughs> and where I close the door and say and feel the way that I really want to speak and feel without him in the room, you know, right. like I'm in my bathroom and I'm like saying crazy things to myself. I'm like, oh, okay, leave that in here and then go out and be a good mom. And obviously I have moments that I have not always been patient in front of him, but I think overall, Overall, I'm patient and I'm fortunate to have like, a, I feel like a lot of help around me So it, with him. So it's not overwhelming. I think the main thing I've realized is that you you can't, for me, you can't be a mom all the time. Like you, you're always mom. You can't be on mom duty all of the time and simulta simultaneously appreciate your child. Yeah. I feel like I have so many friends where they don't have a break from being a mom. Mm -hmm. And you can see that in their mm -hmm. face. And I don't mean it in a good way. Like yeah. it's sad. Yeah. Because everybody every dynamic's different and like to each their own. But you need like time for yourself truly and not time like for your partner. Time for yourself without your kid. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have that, having patience as a mom, I just don't even think it's possible. Yeah. It's like 
It's also what? like we have this, we've had this weird cultural shift, especially like here in like the West where, you know, every couple lives by themselves and raises the kids by themselves. Whereas, you know, historically and a lot of other countries, it's like, it takes a village, right? They say like, it takes a village to raise a child. It's not just two parents raising a kid. It's the extended family. It's the grandparents. Like everybody kind of shares in the duties of raising the child. And that's like something that I don't know, we don't really do in America. We're always like, okay, you need to leave your parents' house and you turn 18, you have to strike out on your own. You have to meet somebody, you have to get your own place. Like, you know, and it's a lot, it's a lot yeah. of pressure on people, especially like single parents. Oh, I think about it all the time, how like even other cultures within America, mm -hmm. they have like homes that are generational homes yes. where the families live together. And I know that some people in the white culture might do that, but it's very rare. And I think it's absurd that, you know, we just send our grandparents off to live at some home and, you know, we're not living with our family and we're not raising our kids as a, fa like as a big village, how it should be. And mm -hmm. it's, I think about it all the time because I have friends who come from different backgrounds where they have like their mom living with them and it's totally common and normal in their culture. And I'm like, what? But that, mm -hmm. that makes sense. They watch your kids. Yeah. It's, Amazing. Yes. Unless yeah. they're, unless they're, unless my, they're my mother, who I love very much, but I can't trust to babysit. Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> Cause she's like got fucking ADHD. And she gets right. Like distracted. I mean, she's, yeah. she's, she's great. Like reading her a story yeah. at night, but yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> I feel that I understand. <laughs> um, so I want to go back to the conversation we had, we're having earlier about consent. Oh. Um, so, you know, one thing that you know, I noticed when I had a kid and I started listening to the podcast and taking like the online workshops and like reading the books and all that stuff about like how to be a good parent um, is there was talk about consent and how it's important from an early age to let your kid kind of decide like what they want to do with their body. I don't know. That's, that's probably not the right way to say it, but like, okay. So one example that was given, like, okay, if your kid doesn't want to go kiss, like your grandmother like yeah. don't make them do yeah. it you know and I was like right. oh, okay that's that's interesting yeah. you know what I mean yeah just stuff like that and, yeah. and, and maybe also like tell them when you're gonna you need to do things to them like okay I'm gonna wipe your bottom now like stuff like that mm -hmm. just I don't know like informed consent about mm -hmm. and and recognizing their autonomy as a as a child yeah um and so that was something that I found interesting and I'm definitely trying to integrate into my you know parenting so now I have a girl you are raising a boy. Yeah. So how are you, do you think about that? And do you think about how can I raise my son to be like respectful of other people, of women? Every fucking like day. That? I'm so worried. <laughs> I'm so worried. <sighs> like not a day goes by where I'm not messaging one of my friends who is a doctor or a psychologist asking them like, you know, what am I going to do? Look at this photo of my baby hitting somebody <laughs> at a party or doing something. It's just, that's just what little kids do, yeah. Rachel. And I'm like, okay, great. How do I tell him that's not okay? Yeah. It's so hard. I don't know. I mean, it's a lot of pressure and I definitely think it's possible, but it's, it's a constant thing. It's like always on the forefront of my mind it's like okay how am I going to raise a, a man that respects women that cares about women and about their consent and their autonomy and not be like an overbearing crazy person yeah I don't know I haven't figured it out yet but I will <laughs> but I think like just having the recognition that that's something that you need to talk to your son about I think yeah. you're halfway there yeah 100%. because you know you think about you think about our parents and like the lack of resources and information that they had raising us, you know, and I think about the ways that my parents may have fell short, but like they didn't know, like nobody knew, you know what I mean? And my parents were great parents and I had a great childhood, but you know, like every parent, we can always find things about our parents that like, you know, they didn't do right, quote unquote, right? Yeah. Yeah, maybe. But I think maybe we also give people a lot especially I feel like the dads, but I feel like we mm -hmm. give people a lot of excuses where it's like, no, you could have done better. You did have tools. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Maybe not as many as we did. Yeah. But you know, yeah. I guess it depends on what specifically you're talking about, right? Because well, we're, we're consent. Just yeah. But about. if we're talking about some really egregious, like, <laughs> you know, violation, yeah. no, 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 story. no, no. You're right. Uh, we, yes. We have more 
education and information than they ever did, especially with technology. Mm -hmm. So we have no excuses. (laughs) Yes, I agree. So we're like, my kid's hitting it and literally like just Google like what to do when my child is hitting. Yes, yes. And then you, especially with a toddler who's like growing, I bet you're in your mind like downloading all those blockers on all of like the iPads and the phones and the computers so that they can't access like sites that are not for them. Yeah. Right? Well, I don't let her like use a phone or an iPad. No, and, yeah, unless, but just like in the forefront of your mind, I'm sure you're prepping for that, right? Yeah. I mean, I'm not going to let her have her own device. I guess, yeah, for a no, long yeah, time. And I, and I figure like I'm not even going to figure that out until like she's probably yeah. like five, yeah. six, seven years from now. Yeah. And I don't know, maybe I'm hoping by then like we would have figured out what the fuck we're going to do with today's youth and like their yeah. constant use of like yeah. devices. We'll like by then we, yeah. we will know or the culture would have shifted. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. Or there would be a big volcano and everybody's gone. <laughs> <laughs> right. Then there the could be that too. aliens have come and got us. Oh my God. How exciting. Dude, right? So cool. I mean, not to segue into aliens, but like my husband and I have been talking about this lately. And the fact that like the government has acknowledged the fact that there are UFOs that are unexplainable and like and like kind of no one's really talking about it is fucking mind blowing. Right. I just see all these memes that are like, we have to pay our rent. That's why we're not talking about it. I I saw that one too. And it was it like kids in their twenties and it was like, I'm just trying to buy a house. I don't care about aliens. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) It's just so wild. No, it is. It really is. I know. I can't wait to see them. I I can, (laughs) I think. I don't know. I'm excited. And it's so wild, too, that we can be like, aliens exist, and people aren't like, you're crazy. It's like literally been proven that, I don't know. Yeah, no, it's incredible. Unidentified flying objects have been. No, no, no. For sure. We've seen enough interviews from people that used to work for the government or that work for the government that said that they saw the alien body, and that I am confident that there's. Oh, I haven't seen those ones. I'll send them right after that. My husband's been watching a lot of these documentaries. It's incredible. But, like, for sure, like, definitely the government has confirmed, like. Yeah. Yeah, and released footage. Amazing. It's fucking wild, man. It is. What a crazy world we live in. I know. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> doesn't matter because AI is going to take over our bodies anyways. And then, like, you know, we won't know. the. Best. I believe that AI does so much for us now. <sighs> I know. I know. Do you worry about um, the future for your son now that, like, you have one and you're seeing the world change at such a rapid pace? It's a loaded question, right? Because it's like, what aspect of the world? The climate? The culture? <laughs> Everything. <laughs> yeah. And then at the same time, I'm like... We're so lucky like, to be alive in this moment. So I try not to overwhelm myself with the news cycle, even though I listen to the news every day. I try not to like let it get into my head where I can't just like appreciate the now. You know? Yeah. I mean, I honestly don't listen to the news because yeah, a lot it, gives of people me, don't. it gives me so much anxiety. I don't blame you. It's fucked up. And my husband's like really into politics, into the news. So like if there's anything crazy that I need to know about, like he He'll will tell let me. You know. But gen- like I might listen to like the morning edition of NPR every once in a while, but mostly I don't listen to the news because it's just like, especially now that I have a kid, like I, I can definitely like twist myself into oh. a-, a crazy spiral of like freaking out about the climate, fucking aliens, fucking like what I jobs guess. are there going to be like for my kid when she's of working oh. age, like oh. all this stuff, like yeah. I can like really go to some dark places like spiral yeah and and only since i had a kid like before that i was kind of like well whatever you know i'm only gonna live another like 40 years or something like that and now i'm just like everything is like gives me anxiety <laughs> no news for you no news for me uh, no <laughs> um so are you concerned about telling your son about what you do someday I don't know if concerned is the right word. I am thoughtful. I think about it all the time. I'm like, oh gosh, this conversation, I need to figure it out now so that it's not like a surprise to me in however many years when I do have the conversation with him. But I don't think concerned is the right word because I feel confident that I'm going to raise a man that respects women and that would respect 
sex work in general. Mm -hmm. And I feel like I'm going to be able to keep him sheltered enough to the point where I don't have him surrounded by a bunch of people that make him feel othered for having a mom that, you know, has been in adult films for so long or that has an OnlyFans. Like, I, I definitely think about things that could go wrong, but I'm like, overall, I just know in my heart that it's going to be okay and that he's going to love and respect me and that the conversation will happen when it's supposed to happen. And also, I'm going to get to him before the media gets to him. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, he doesn't watch TV now, but I'm not going to let him watch TV for quite a bit of time. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm – it's going to want to have those conversations earlier on because I don't want him seeing something if he's at a friend's house and somehow I'm not able to con control what he's watching or taking in. I want him to already have like an informed opinion and information about what he is viewing. Mm -hmm. You know, my yeah. worst nightmare that I would be concerned about is having a kid, not having those conversations with them and then them watching a video and making their own decisions and their own, like, opinions off that video about, like, sex or porn or something, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, that to me is, oh, my God, what a nightmare. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I will say, and if this is of any consolation to you, you know, I mean, my mom never performed in movies, but obviously she directed a lot of them and obviously shot a lot of porn yeah. my whole life. And people have often asked me, like, you know, what was it like to have parents who were pornographers? And I was like... I don't know, what's it like to have like crazy Christian parents who like shame you for masturbating? I'm like, that sounds weird to me. You know, I think it's it's all about like normalcy is relative. And exactly. my parents never raised me with a sense of shame about sex, about the no. naked body or anything like that. So like there was no shock moment. You know, people are always asking me like, when did you find out? And I'm like, <laughs> I don't remember because I kind of always knew. You know, because oh. there wasn't like a moment where they sat me down. They're like, we need to tell oh. you something. like. You know, mommy doesn't, you know, take pictures of food for a living. This is what she does. Like, there was never that conversation because they were always, I think, just, you know, I from, like, a young age, I think the first thing I knew was that mommy and daddy make movies and take photos for grownups. Hmm. And it's not appropriate for you. You're a child. I love that. They're grownups, so yeah. you're not allowed in the office into yeah. this back room and you're not – like allowed because it's not for you and when you're a kid you're like you don't really care Nothing's about what you're for you I yeah and and like you don't really care what your parents do for a living like as long as they have the money to like buy you barbie dream house you know what i mean <laughs> like what they do yeah. and then obviously as i got older i became more interested um but you know by then i knew what they did and it wasn't it wasn't like weird because no, they they, 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 they never made it weird yeah and they were always there and they were, you know, great parents and loved me and supported me and made yeah. me feel safe. Yeah. So, like, it wasn't. Perception is everything, exactly. right? It's like, who are you around? Who's yes. telling you the things that you're thinking, you know? Yeah. Like, even, even when I drop my son off at, like, a daycare, the principal knows what I do for work. And if the principal knew what I did for work and made it uncomfortable – Mm -hmm. then I might be concerned. But because nobody does that to me, and because I'm telling you, I feel like we really – well, we're privileged to live in Southern California, but we're just living in a different time. Mm -hmm. It's not – it's it's going to be okay. It's yeah. fine. But, like, for you, I'm surprised that it was, like, so normalized because, I mean, that was a while ago, you yeah. know, when you were growing up. And it, it's unique that your parents were pornographers. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, but yeah, I mean, again, it was like you said, like the perception that I was raised with. I mean, yes. it definitely came up when I was in school. You know, there was a time I remember like the first thing was I had to write a paper. My, I had an assignment to write a paper about like what my mom did for a living. Yeah. And I had to come home and my dad had to help me like kind of write around what she did for a living. Well, yeah. Like, Cause I couldn't literally like in third grade be like, my mom shoots porn. So we sure. alluded to some of like the mainstream stuff that she had done. Yeah. Like she, she was a glamor photographer. So my dad yeah. would help me kind of craft the story. Well, yeah. Which really was just like, so I didn't, you know, like other parents, other kids' parents, like right. adults, like who might, you know, then ask me inappropriate questions. 
it was more about that. It wasn't yes. about what they were doing was right. wrong. Right. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. But um, and then there was you know the case of the kid who brought a penthouse magazine to school, and then my mom's name was in it as the photographer, and then it got passed around the classroom, and then like. Yeah. Everybody was talking about how my mom yeah. was in the magazine. Yeah. Um, and then the principal took it away and then, like, called my mom. But the thing was, I didn't bring it to school, I think. But for some reason, I got blamed. Of course you did. And then, like, my mom, my mom told the principal, she's like, well, it's about time you had some good reading material. Oh, my gosh. She would say that. <laughs> and then he was just like, well, what are we going to do? <laughs> nothing. There's nothing to do. Yeah. Oh, that's but so it, funny. How old were you? I mean, I was in elementary school. Oh, I was God, young. That's way too young for somebody to be bringing that to school. Yeah, it was definitely like not appropriate. What? Yeah. But anyways, but it, I don't know. Like, I don't remember that. Fa- I mean, I remember that situation obviously clearly, but I don't remember it phasing me or like making me feel shamed. Like, I think people were trying to shame me, but I don't Trouble. remember feeling shamed. Right, because you were raised a way that if that shame came to you, you were like, no, I don't need to feel the shame. I already know people are trying to do that. That's not part of who I want to be. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. Um, and then the other question I wanted to ask you was, um, you've mentioned that you feel like 18 is probably too young to come into yeah. porn. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, I didn't come into porn until I was like 21, but I did start – working in the sex industry when I was like 18, 19 years old. And I have lots of friends who are doctors, geriatric doctors, psychotherapists, like all all different people that have studied the human brain. And your frontal lobe, your brain doesn't finish forming until you're 25 years old. And that part is the one that makes the decisions. Mm -hmm. And so for me, knowing that scientific information makes me feel like very validated and thinking that you should probably wait until your brain's formed to mm-hmm. make big choices that follow you for the rest of your life, especially when it comes to sex on film. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, I just, there's no there's no reason that somebody needs to be doing it, I, I think, before age 25, but I could totally understand why people might not like that opinion. It's just my personal opinion based on my personal, you know, experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's interesting because I've, I've heard both sides and both sides totally make sense to me. Yeah. Um, I know 18 year olds who are much older than their years who are like, this got me out of a bad situation. Sure. Put me like on a path to success. But I also know a lot of 18 year olds who are like, that was, that was a bad choice. That was a bad choice. I made (laughs) bad decisions. I know more of those ones, but yes, I agree with you. So what do you feel about like the, cause you know, the common counter argument would probably be, well, you can go join the army and go to war at 18. Like that's probably not a good idea either. (laughs) right (laughs) I mean I personally don't think we should go to war period yeah I know I was like overall (laughs) that's a bad that's a uh, did you see the Barbie movie the what movie Barbie movie I was gonna say that's a mojo dojo casa house but (laughs) nobody anybody that's seen it will know what I'm talking about anyway yes I think it's war is a bad idea but I definitely think 18 is too young to go to war too yeah I also if given those like two choices would say you know um go to war because they just they just use young guys right not with <laughs> i don't know no i i agree i think 18 is too young for war yeah and for unfortunately porn. there's no way the government's gonna raise that age <laughs> because they need oh blame god i'm not at, i'm not like you know out there protesting for it. it's just an opinion yeah yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. just one i i have and i needed to air out <laughs> <laughs> no i hear you i mean i'm yeah. all for it but yeah it's just, anyways we don't need to get into politics <laughs> Today, that's not what we're here for. Yeah. <laughs> um, but we are here to talk about your book. Yeah. <laughs> um, Tasha Rain from Princess to Porn Star. If you guys can look, it's on the b- bookshelf behind her. There you go. Um, and tell us a little bit about what inspired you to write this book. Oh, my goodness. So I wanted to write a book for a while while I was performing in movies because I thought it was interesting like the job was curious and fascinating and I really wanted to write a book about it but then I got to 
USC and I got to choose a thesis and my thesis was the book proposal. So it made it a lot easier to write the book because I had the proposal after graduation. Mm. However, the actual book that came out has almost nothing to do with what I thought I was going to be writing about. I was like, I'm going to make this like fun, positive book about like kind of my trajectory into porn and inspire other women to maybe do it, maybe not, just like kind of shed a light on the adult industry in a good, positive way. But as you know, when you write, you don't control the writing, Mm -hmm. right? It's just pen to paper. This is what's coming out. And unfortunately, it really became so dark so quickly. I didn't even, there was so much more I could have written, but it just all of a sudden became like chapter after chapter of these traumatic things. And they were nuanced because they're not like so jarring and crazy that, you know, crazier things happen to happen to other people. It was just, I went to write this story about my experience in the porn industry and a lot of trauma came out in the writing. And I didn't realize that until the end of the book. (laughs) However, I'm really happy I did it because I feel like almost like this weight has been lifted where I'm like, oh, I got that out. Thank God. It's off my shoulders and into the pages. And so I did the audible for it the other, like recently I recorded it and I was jarred. I was like, oh my God, did I really say this? Why did I write this? This is crazy. I shouldn't have said that. And I had all of like that. It's like a vulnerability hangover kind of yes. feeling. But um, but yeah, I'm really proud of her. Yeah. So you found it to be a cathartic process. Very. Yeah. And then tell me about um, your actual writing process, because I know a lot of people who've written books say that they have to like set a schedule because otherwise you'll kind of start and then just like drop off. (laughs) Did you have to like really be on yourself and like set a date of like, okay, this is when I'm going to be done? No, but the next book for sure I'll do that because Mm. that is such a great point that you need to like have a schedule (laughs) where you write. Yeah. No, no, I did that where it was like, oh, I would just drop off. And then I'm like, oh, I got to come back. I've got to reel it in and come back. So then how long did it take you to write the book? I mean, a couple of years, but I was pregnant through the writing of the book. And um, yeah, I mean, it it took longer than it should have because of that issue that most writers, a lot of writers have where it's like, you know, you get sidetracked, you think there's other things to do in the day, and you're like, no, I'm on an actual deadline. Like, I'm supposed to be turning in work. Mm-hmm. So it was a struggle for me, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. What did you, when you finished and you were done with the book, what do you think is, like, the takeaway from the book? I hope that the takeaway for the reader is that consent is the most important part about sex, period, and that the conversation around sex and consent needs to happen in their home and with their family. And it's critical to like the safety of a person. And also that, you know, if they didn't, if they had a perception of adult stars, I hope that they read the book and it's somehow different. They're like, oh, it's like more of a humanized person that is in these like films that we jerk off to. Mm-hmm. Oh, those are porn stars that people do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, where can people find the book? You can find the book on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Audible, anywhere you buy your books. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, Tasha, thank you so much for coming on. It's thank been such a pleasure to see me. you. Um, can you let everybody know where they can find you online? You can find me on... I don't know. Wait, wait, where? Social media or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think mostly social media plugs. Oh, okay. So find me on Instagram at Tasha Rain's Life and at Twitter on Tasha Rain. Yeah. Fantastic. And don't forget that you can buy her book on Amazon, at Barnes and Nobles, wherever you get your books. And of course, if you guys want to follow me, I'm also on Instagram at Holly Randall, on Twitter at Holly Randall. Go to Holly's links. No, not Holly's. Holly, Holly links. Holly's links? Oh, shit. What is it? Holly links. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Holly links. (laughs) Wow. I know. I'm like, I forgot what my URL is. Hollylinks.com for links to all of my platforms. And make sure that you drop Tasha a note. Let her know that you saw her here on this podcast. So she knows that the visit was well worth it. And definitely go out and buy her book. 
Thank you guys so much for watching. I'll see you next week.